Good afternoon and welcome to our uh, first FinTech Influencers uh, Digital Meetup. Um, apologies, we can't provide you beer and pizza today, but uh, feel free to uh, raid the fridge and uh, sit back and enjoy the conversation. As with all our advanced technology uh, special interest group uh, meetups, what we try to do is discuss cutting edge technology and their application within the financial markets. So today, we're looking at the application of artificial intelligence uh, in investment banking operations. And to uh, join us on that, we have a great panel made up of Matt Squire, Angelique Dwyer, and Josh Ricks. So guys, could you possibly just quickly introduce yourselves and give us an idea of your backgrounds, please? Matt, do you want to lead off? Hi, I'm Matt. I'm the co-founder of Fuzzy Labs, and we're an artificial intelligence consultancy based in Manchester. Hi, I'm Angelique Dwyer. I'm a principal consultant at the Realisation Group. But prior to joining the Realisation Group, I was the global head of client relationship management within HSBC Markets Operations. And I'm Josh Ricks, director of Woodhurst Consulting. We are a digital transformation consultancy focused on financial services and specialising in AI, cloud computing and other innovative technologies. Thanks very much, guys. Um, so looking at uh, the use of AI in uh, investment banking operations uh, and the investment banking market in totality, some of the things we want to have a look at today is, in reality, how advanced is financial markets in its use of AI? Uh, secondly, is the real use less than people would like us to believe? Is it a bit of smoke and mirrors of marketing? Um, so what is AI actually being used for within the market? And lastly, what do organizations need to do to prepare for the use of AI and set themselves up for success. Um, to kick off the conversation, I think it's probably worth looking at the technical aspects of uh, underpinning AI today. Um, to discuss that a little bit further and give us some background, Matt, do you feel like uh, you're able to kick, at, uh, kick us off with that? Yes, absolutely. There are three broad areas of technology that I would like to highlight to get us started, and then maybe we can get more into the specifics as it applies to the financial world. So the first one is optical character recognition. Now, this is something that's been around for absolutely decades. <clears throat> it's simply the ability to take a paper document that might be printed or handwritten and translate that into a digital form so that we can store it in a database or analyze it or do some automation on it. And then naturally following that, we have a whole bunch of different technologies that fall under the umbrella of natural language processing. And this has to do with understanding language, understanding text, and being able to get a feel for the meaning and the intention behind the text. So, for example, if we wanted to take a whole, whole load of um, paper documents that come from maybe humans filling in forms or sending their utility bills to a central location. We could start with OCR reading that text rather than having humans read it, but then we could use natural language processing to understand, well, this particular document is a utility bill, this is an identity document, and then we can drill even further into it and say, well, here's a, a name or an address or a monetary amount in that document or using techniques from uh, natural language processing. Um, and then another aspect of NLP, which I will also touch on, is sentiment analysis. And this allows us to say, is this piece of text, does it express a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment or something else? And we might use that for news articles to look at, let's say, um, potential trends in certain industries or sectors that could then inform investment decisions. Uh, we might also use it to look at how people are talking about a company or a brand on Twitter, for example. And then the final area of technology that I think can be very relevant is image processing and image recognition. So this includes things like facial recognition, and it includes the popular toy project that everybody who gets started on an AI project will, will be told to do. This is like the first tutorial can I identify what breed of dog a dog is from a photo? But then we could do something maybe a little bit more practical with that same technology. So you might say, I'm doing market research and I want to go to a pub 
take a photo of everything behind the bar. And then I want it to identify which brands is this pub selling. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks, Matt. So, Josh, can I just go to you? Matt's described a number of lying of, sort of underlying technologies that uh, are being used within AI. Given your experience with your clients, which do you think is the most relevant to them at the moment? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it boils down to what solutions are available in the market today, where there's vendors that are making these technologies available. And one of the things we see quite predominantly in financial services and, and other industries as well is around the use of NLP with chatbots and probably coupling that with a little bit of uh, sort of subtle automation in the background as well so that you can present this sort of customer-facing chatbot tool that reduces the pressure on operational staff, maybe within branches of retail banks or call centers, or maybe other areas of other industries. Um, and these chatbots are able to sort of process that natural language input and either root a query a question to the right location, or they could even respond in a, in a particular way. You even see this on, on LinkedIn now, I think, as well. If When you're doing direct messages with people, you can see a, a preempted response based on the information that's come through from the um, person you're talking to. So I think those types of tools are pretty prevalent today. And, and, and there's applications for them in investment banking operations as well, maybe with client emails or routing of particular requests coming through or even identifying operational procedures internally within the bank. It seems to me that quite a lot of um, the usage you're talking about there is very much client facing, customer facing, rather than the operational side of it. Um, just, just quickly from your perspective, is it due to the different types of data sets or the legacy systems involved in post-trade and operations, which makes maybe the use of AI in those areas less uh less widespread at the moment yeah i think i think that's probably a fair comment uh when you look at the specific solutions that you might need to support trade processing or trade execution it probably needs to be fairly customized and fairly unique to a particular organization or asset class or or set of products um which means that it might need to be made internally rather than being readily available across the market. Whereas if you take a fundamental capability such as NLP, that can be fairly well applied um, yeah, to customer facing tools, but also internally as well. Like I say, if you replace your sort of FAQ section with a chatbot internally to source um, procedural documentation. You could just have natural language input, someone talking to it um, in a human manner, and it can respond with the right sort of procedure or documentation you're looking for. Brilliant. That's really, really helpful uh, to understand your thoughts around that. From a practical uh, experience, Angelique, I know you have a lot of experience in client operations across numerous banks, luckily HSBC. I'd love to understand from, from your experience um, the sort of uh, use cases uh, that are being uh, looked at and deployed into across operations with it within banks at the moment. Sure. Um, I guess I'll start um, with uh, my view currently is that most large investment banks today are certainly very aware of the benefits presented by AI, and some are already quite heavily involved in deploying um, solutions enabled by it. Um, that to me is unsurprising in order to reap the financial savings and control benefits that can be brought about by AI. By AI. Um, and that's in addition to the huge improvement in overall client experience that it can bring. Um, I think the challenge for those not already actively embracing it lies less in the fact that they don't see the value or the benefit but more around some of the associated underpinning data issues, which can make it difficult to get this kind of stuff off the ground. Um, so that means if the data is not complete, it's not clean, it's not accurate, that can pose problems down the line. But I'm sure we'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, until now, I think it's worth noting that the majority of the AI spend within capital markets has been focused predominantly on enabling front office trading and customer facing business functions, um, while operations has relatively uh, remained uncharted territory in comparison. Yeah. So, so that really goes back to some of the th points that Josh was making earlier. 
Yeah, exactly that. Um, so for the organisations that are already embarking or have embarked upon their AR journey, there are a number of areas where these kind of technologies are very much established and providing to be really successful already. Um, and I think the heaviest adoption of this technology has really been in tasks such as automating reconciliations and trade matching processes. So that brings about exception management, uh, far less exception management and enables faster and more effective remediation of errors. And um, I think some banks have gone much further than that already um, to the point where they're utilizing AI to detect and prevent um, payment fraud. So UBS, for example, has used AI and machine learning to improve processes for um, anti-money laundering and KYC. So know your customer checks. Um, and they've, un they've taken ultimately some very manual, um, highly FT intense, so headcount processes to simply managing um, exception queues managed by far less people with the use of those tools. So thereby reducing the risk to the organization far more quickly and effectively. So really impressive there. Um, I've personally seen the benefit of utilizing OCR technology during my time um, at HSBC, predominantly in the documentation space. Um, so that was uh, in the client onboarding um, uh, arena. Um, so that's essentially we'll be using software that scans documents and uh, containing text and converts them into documents that can be edited, stored digitally, um, et cetera. And on a more practical level, um, uh, I think there's another organization that did a really good job of this a couple of years ago and they were potentially first out of the traps or one of the first, and that was BMP Paribas. Um, and they introduced a tool called Smart Chaser. So that's a, a trade matching tool used, uh, using artificial intelligence and predictive analysis. Um, and it predicts essentially the likelihood that a trade won't match automatically with a counterparty and will require manual intervention. So the tool essentially predicts the likelihood of a, of a delay to matching, determines the contributors to the delay, and then actually suggests a predetermined email template uh, for the operations person to send to the client. So enhancing the client experience, reducing risk, it's a really, really good example of this type of technology. So they're kind of some of the, 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 um, the, the pieces of work I've seen already in place. I think one of the more interesting pieces that we will see going forward, and certainly this came uh, later on during my last role at HSBC, was um, looking at um, the potential of utilizing NLP and predictive analysis in relation to client email routing again to Josh's point um, and getting uh, essentially some automated type responses going out to clients and um, it's something that people are generally quite scared of, uh, you know, because there's a lot of, there's a huge amount of work that goes in to underpin that. Um, but I think there is huge potential there just in terms of uh, if it's deployed in a controlled uh, fashion, uh, it has the potential to bring about a huge amount of um, gains for some of the larger organisations. Actually, brilliant. Thank you. That's a, that's a great overview. And there's obviously some uh, banks well ahead of others in, in their adoption. I'm, I'm guessing that part of that could be the level of investment that's available for uh, for banks and the ability to have quick return on investment. Do you, do you find that is the case from your experience? Yes, definitely. I think culturally it also comes down to, well, yes, there's a couple of things. There's purse strings that are involved in this kind of scenario. So, you know, the appetites of uh, certain organizations to spend, it kind of depends on what their digital and their technology footprint looks like and whether they are quite forward thinking um, in this regard or essentially if it's, uh, you know, if they're willing to, you know, spend in, an, in, in, a, in a tough environment on something that potentially won't bring them gains for immediate gains, but you might not see the benefit for a couple of years, but that's certainly been my experience. Yeah. Matt, is that something that you're seeing with your work with clients that, uh, yeah, the trade-off between spend now and uh, jam later, if that makes sense. Um, is that something you've been seeing? So that's that's interesting. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit when it comes to AI implementations in that a lot of the, the basic problems have been solved and it's probably the case that more of those problems are on the customer-facing side where more people have the same problem. So something like chatbots or... Um, predictions for text and things like that now what we have what's emerged in the last decade or so is that the big cloud providers are all offering their own ai as a service so for instance if you want ocr capabilities or a chatbot or 
your own um, language processing. So figure out what the customer is saying and how happy they are, for, for example. A lot of that is already available and ready to use, and it doesn't cost all that much, provided that you're happy as a business to say, we'll just rely on these cloud resources. Whereas if it's something a lot more bespoke, where the, the application and the data that goes into it are very specific to the business in question, that's where there can be a lot of cost. Um, and what we often tell our clients is, let's start off with what we can do using readily available services and work our way towards something more bespoke. And that way, you can get a, a proof of concept very quickly for little cost and then justify maybe more budget for something bigger. That's interesting. So by the sound of things, there's some almost off-the-shelf type solutions that people can get started with relatively quickly, but you obviously need to make sure that your own data sets are as clean and robust as possible to start using that effectively to, I suppose, get yourself started and then move forward from there. Absolutely. That's interesting. Brilliant. Well, that's actually super. So I think that leads us on very nicely to, you know, what do organizations really need to uh, roll the turf and put the foundations in to get start their AI journey? Um, Josh, I think you obviously work with numerous clients in this area. Can you share your experiences of what a customer needs to do, uh, a customer of yours or somebody in the market generally needs to do to really set themselves up for success in embarking on an AI project? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I, I think Matt's point there is absolutely valid that in order to just start on that journey, there are a lot of readily available tools out there. So I think as far as experimentation, performing proof of concepts, maybe small pilots is concerned, um, organizations should be confident to sort of crack on and do with that. But if we look at more the concept of enterprise AI, the concept of creating a, an AI capability that then builds a competitive advantage for your firm, for your organization, or for your function. Um, there's a number of sort of foundational layers that need to be put in place or foundational layers that you need to look at to set yourself up for success, like you say. Um, we look at we look at five of these in turn, and I'll touch upon them pretty quickly now. I, we've spoken about it a lot already. The first one's data. It's the lifeblood of machine learning projects, the lifeblood of AI. You need to make sure it's accessible, that you can easily extract and move data across the organization. So we've mentioned already that it's complete, it's accurate. There isn't too much manual data entry in the process. Um, and you need to make sure you have a lot of it, particularly where you're targeting these customized machine learning tools and these customized solutions. Uh, the second key pillar is, is technology. And this is really about making sure you have the technical capability to run, to build, and to train these machine learning tools and solutions. It's about ensuring you have the compute power accessible across the organization so your engineers can spin up these development environments, sandbox instances to play with, to experiment, and to build these tools out, whether that's cloud-based resources or whether they're on-premises. You need to make sure that you've got that compute power. And then the next key pillar is making sure that these individuals have the capabilities they need to build these tools. So the people aspect is absolutely fundamental. What does your data science capability as an organization look like? But not just in terms of raw data scientists that may perform that analysis, may choose the models, do model selection. What sort of machine learning engineers do you have? Who are the people that are really gonna build and maintain these pro products when they're pushed through into production and ensure that where machine learning is involved, that they are always improving and always building upon themselves. We've spoken already a little bit about the culture and the mindset that you need in order to open up the purse strings and look at the return on investment that's realistic for some of these projects and how you fail fast, prove value early, and then secure that investment going forward. So I think the culture of the organization is absolutely key. And then the final piece we look at is processes. Do your procurement functions allow you to work with some of these smaller innovative vendors? Does your data governance team, your IT security team, allow you to move data across the organization, potentially across geographies? Um, can you move it to an external vendor? 
And also from a fundamental process aspect, do you have a process that allows you to perform these projects on a repeatable but fairly flexible manner depending on the use case? So do you have a, a way of executing AI projects um, consistently that will allow you to do it in a way that drives that competitive advantage and drives that AI um, capability rather than just dabbling here and there in pockets within the organization. I think that's incredibly interesting and very insightful, those different pillars. Anjali, I'd love to come back to you and pick up a couple of the, the points that Josh has made there. We've talked about purse strings, we've talked about budget, we've talked about return on investment. You know, banks over the last 10, 12 years has been inherently difficult to get budget. You've obviously got experience of working with AI projects within um, organizations you've worked in before. The drivers for that, could you give us an idea of how much of is quick ROI important in a project? Um, secondly, what are the drivers? Is it more savings? Is it uh, efficiency? Or is it enhancing customer experience? Or is it is it all three together, but one, one always wins over the others? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I guess, uh, well, okay, I'll give you my view of, 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 uh, of the world and certainly my experience. So um, I think first and foremost, the biggest challenge I've ever encountered coming into these kinds of conversations around adopting this kind of technology is, as you mentioned, the first question you get asked by the person who's holding the budget, budget strings, the budget holder is, okay, what's my ROI? What's the return on investment? Um, and in the last, um, I would say, 18 to 24, maybe even to 36 months, um, the next question that follows is, okay, um, and what's the headcount saving associated with what you're trying to do here? So <laughs> I kind of inadvert inadvertently answered your question from a cost standpoint. Um, so it, it, it's really, it is actually really, really difficult to even launch some of these conversations uh, in the first instance without a very crisp, very clean uh, articulation of what your ROI is, is or perceived is ROI is going to be. Um, if you don't make that impactful case earlier on uh, in your discussions, then you are not very likely to progress. Um, I think that uh, it's interesting because historically, um, sales and trading have always been able to articulate uh, the benefit where there's investment, where they're asking for investment, because it's you know quite a clear cut numbers game. But if you take it to operations, uh, you know, you touched upon if it's a client experience initiative, that's far less tangible to articulate the ROI, but clearly the client experience is critical and that's whether that's at the front or, or the end of the transaction. Um, so that's very, very hard um, as well. Um, quantifying return on investment can be very, very difficult. Um, uh, and I guess unless it's regulatory, which kind of wins out on everything else, then you know that's, that, that kind of pips everything else to the post. So I, I guess in summary, um, in this environment, I think cost uh, savings and efficiency certainly win now over the client experience, which is a real shame uh, given my background because um, I think that is probably the wrong way of thinking about things in, 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 in this regard. But, uh, you know, it depends on the environment that, re that you're in. And, you know, the, again, the cultural point, what's the organization's forward looking view uh, around this type of thing? Uh, is it immediate cost saving now or are they willing to invest in their future and take a bit of a, 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 a check or, a, you know, a drawdown on that balance now? Angelique, many thanks for those insights. That's exceptionally helpful to help us understand um, from, you know, from your experience. One thing I'd love to dig into a bit deeper, and Matt, if you could pick up on this, this would be great, is actual fact what firms need to be doing to get their data into, into the right shape to be able to lead off an AI strategy. Yeah, of course, every large organization has an enormous amount of data. But it's, it's often the case that, or it's, it's always the case, that a project needs to start from a clearly defined purpose, and then the data needs follow that. And so it might be, for example, that the business has identified a particular manual process which can be automated and therefore save costs. And then the next question has to be, well, what data do we need to have available to build an AI system that can automate that process. And the data might be, 
let's say, um, some historical paper documents which the organization deals with and some information about those documents, which can then be used to train an AI model, which can automate what a human is doing. And so the data has to follow the, the need rather than the other way around. We can't see what data we have and then justify what we want to do. We have to start with what do we want to do? What data do we need? And then, of course, from that, we start to say, well, is the data we have actually in the right format to solve this problem? So then we can be specific. We can say, uh, are we missing particular pieces of information that are critical to train a machine to do this? Is the data stored in an inconsistent way? Maybe there's one database which has dates in UK format and another database which has dates in US format. And this is all supposed to be the same data set. So these kinds of things we need to iron out. But once we know the purpose that we're doing it for, then we can understand specifically what do we need to do to get there. Yeah, that um, brings us nearly to the end of the time that we've got allocated for today. But I'd love to get some closing thoughts from the panel. Um, Matt, could you kick us up just with some closing thoughts uh, around the discussion we've had today, please? Yeah, the one thing I would say is don't aim to reinvent the wheel. So there's a huge amount of ready-done solutions for a lot of common problems that can be tackled with AI. And these can be used as a starting point. And even if it's the case that the thing down the road, the final thing is more complicated, if we can build a simple proof of concept using what's readily available quickly and cheaply, then we can justify the budget to do something bigger. That's great. Josh, I'd love to hear from you before we hand over to Angelique. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Matt started to touch on it, actually, when he was talking about data. But for me, I think one of the key takeaways to get to that point of enterprise AI, where AI is a competitive advantage, thinking about the holistic AI strategy is really important. What is it that you want to do as an organization or as, as a function, as an operations function within an investment bank? What do you want to get from AI? What benefits do you want to take from it? And what are you trying to achieve? And everything should trickle down from that. How do you organize your data? What technology do you need? What capabilities do we need within the organization? And so forth. And I think that's a really good place to start while you're experimenting and playing with AI and getting a better understanding of it uh, within your engineering teams. Brilliant. That's great. And Anjali, final thoughts from you? Um, I think quite simply for me, uh, I think the, you know, as I said before, the the potential based on my experience uh, for AI and ops is huge. Um, I think coming back to probably uh, one of the later questions that we answered was, you know, be able to very clearly articulate quite soon on in the process um, your ROI, what is your benefit case, and be able to articulate that very, very succinctly and clearly early on to give you the best possible chance of of uh, taking forward uh, whatever your, your request is uh, for this type of technology, because there's certainly a huge amount of opportunity in this space. That's great. Thank you very much, Angelique. Thank you to all the panellists. It's, it's been a great discussion. I think we've learned a lot. Um, thank you for everybody who's joined us for our first uh, virtual uh, meetup. Um, we'll be putting the panellists' uh, contact details on the screen shortly. Feel free to contact them directly if you think they can help with you or your organisation uh, looking at AI and other strategies. Uh, alternatively, if you can get to us on therealisationgroup.com and we can connect you. And lastly, make sure to look out for further events and don't forget to follow, to follow us on LinkedIn. Thanks all and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon.